Another fun thing that you can do in Blender is sculpting, and you can get started with it right away. To sculpt any mesh object, just select it, and then head from Object Mode to Sculpt Mode. Sculpt Mode is a type of edit mode, but we're able to use brushes rather than tweaking individual vertices. Now, since we're just pushing and pulling vertices, the more vertices we have, the more interesting and interactive this is going to feel. So if I just left click on my default cube here, not much is going to happen. So let's head to object mode. Here I'll hit control tab to bring up the pie menu and just swipe left. And let's add a subdivision surface modifier. We can do that in the modifiers tab of the properties editor under generate and subdivision surface. Or remember, you can always use the control number row hotkeys. In this case, I'll crank this all the way up to six. Then if I were to go into sculpt mode now and try to sculpt on my mesh here, still not much is going to happen. That's because even though we're seeing the mesh as its subdivided state, it's still just a cube to sculpt mode. What we need to do is apply this modifier. So I'll go to the drop down in the modifier and click apply. Now when I start sculpting, it has more of an effect. The settings for our brushes can be found in the tool properties up in the header, over in the tool properties in the properties editor, or in the sidebar by hitting N and going to Tool. Here we can adjust the radius of our brush and the strength. The hotkey for these, which are universal throughout all brushes in Blender, is F for the size and Shift F for the strength. The little button just to the right of each of these enables or disables pressure sensitivity if you're using a tablet. I'm using a tablet here to draw, and so to make it easier to navigate, I'm going to go to Edit and Preferences, down to Input, and choose Emulate 3 Button Mouse. I can hold down Alt and left click and drag to orbit the viewport, Alt and Control in order to zoom in and out, and then Alt and Shift to shift my view. To the right of the strength setting, we have this plus and minus, which determine whether the vertices are pushed out or pushed in along their normals. And this is also a pretty common thing to want to switch on the fly. So the hotkey for that is just holding in control. So if I'm in add mode, I'll just hold down control and draw and I'll subtract. Or if I'm in subtract, I can just draw, hold down control and then add. Now there are a lot of brushes in Blender. We definitely don't have time to go over all of them, but let me just drag out the toolbar so we can see their names and we'll go over a couple of them. So far, we've been using the standard draw tool, but there's also a draw sharp tool, which adds a little bit of crease in there. By default, it's set to negative, but you can also hold down control and make that a positive crease. Underneath that, we have the clay, which is used for building up very natural forms. It kind of fills in gaps as well as adds, which does lead to a very clay looking result. Underneath that, we have the clay strips, which is similar to the behavior of clay, but it's much more rough. And this one's really great for quickly hacking out forms. If you combine this with holding control to subtract, you can very quickly build up your shapes. Now I'll skip down a few and let's look at smooth, which just averages out the position of the affected vertices. This one is incredibly common to use in conjunction with other brushes. So you can get to it from any other brush just by holding shift. So often I'll be using my clay strips brush to build something out. And then I'll hold down shift and then left click and drag to smooth that out. So on one side I can have it nice and sharp. And then I can smooth out that other side into the rest of the form. You can also use the flatten brush, which will both add and subtract to flatten out a surface. and the scrape tool to chisel away. Both of these are really fun to use. One of the most important brushes is the grab brush, which allows us to push or pull what's under a brush in any direction. This is similar to grabbing a vertex in edit mode and using proportional editing. In the little project that we're gonna be doing later in this video, we'll be using the one under that quite a bit, which is elastic to form. This is similar to grab, but it tries to preserve the volume of the object. It also has much more of a natural fall off. This one's really great for doing things like making facial expressions on a character, where volume preservation is really important. And the last brush that I want to show you is a bit down in the list, and it's the cloth brush. Now this one you probably won't need to use right away, but if you click and drag on your mesh, it'll run a real-time cloth simulation 
and pull your mesh as if it was cloth in the direction of your brush. Now, if your brush is too big, then your simulation area is going to be a bit bigger and the overall effect will be a bit slower. So if we just shrink our brush a little bit, then we can very quickly just wrinkle this up. Again, you probably won't need this right away, but it's a good example of just how powerful Blender's brushes can be. So go ahead and wrinkle this sphere up a bit, and then let's head back to Object Mode. I'll hit Control Tab and swipe left. Then I'll delete this guy, hit Shift A, and add another cube. For this one, I want to look at the different ways that we can add detail to our objects. Before we added a subdivision surface modifier and applied it, but we can also add detail directly in Sculpt Mode. So I'll hit Control Tab and swipe down, and I'll go to my Clay Strips brush. Of course, if I sculpt on the surface of our cube, nothing's going to happen but we can generate geometry on the fly with dynamic topology. That's an option that's in the top right of our tool header. So just click that on next to Dyn Topo. I don't know exactly how to say that. And you'll probably get a warning, which is letting you know that it's not going to preserve attributes, but that's all right for now, so we can click OK. It will preserve attributes in the future though, so depending on what version of Blender you're using, you might not see that. With that enabled though, we can now just click and drag anywhere, and geometry is going to get added right under our brush. We can see how this is working by going to our overlays, and turning on wireframe. Now, even if we have a really small strength, I'll hit Shift F and bring that pretty far down. You can see all these triangles getting added on the fly. This allows us to really quickly shape our object without having to care about topology whatsoever. It's an incredibly powerful way to work. We can set the detail size under the dynamic topology options. And right now it's set to relative detail, which means that the closer we zoom in, the smaller the detail is going to be. And if I were to zoom back out and paint over the same area, That'll get covered over with larger detail. We could also switch this to constant detail or one of the other options. We can also set it to only subdivide and not collapse or to only collapse and remove detail. For the initial phase of just roughing out an object, I often like to use dynamic topology. But what happens when you're done with your basic forms and you want to start getting really detailed? Well, for that dynamic topology isn't quite as good because it doesn't handle huge poly counts quite as well. So at that stage, you'll probably want to turn this off and use remeshing. For that, I'll go ahead and uncheck dynamic topology, and then let's go right next door under remesh and click remesh. Now it's completely replaced our topology with all quads. We can change the detail size here under voxel size. If I set that to 0.05 and then remesh again, now we'll get more detail to sculpt on. You'll notice that this algorithm is really fast. Now it doesn't follow details. You can see the curvature of this side here isn't really followed with the quads. So I wouldn't use it for retopology, but it's great for quick sculpting. If you'd like, you can remesh on the fly just by hitting Control R. So let's say I make a big change. I'll take my grab brush and really stretch some of these quads out. There, we definitely need this to be remeshed in order to draw on it. So I'll just hit Control R and continue sculpting. Now, if you're just starting out with sculpting, I would recommend using one of those two options, probably dynamic topology. So you won't have to worry about the technical structure of your mesh at all. Though if you're coming from an app like ZBrush or Mudbox and you want to make really highly detailed characters or objects right away, then after your initial retopology, you'll probably want to use the multi-resolution modifier. For that, I'll go back to object mode, delete this monstrosity, hit shift A, and let's add another cube. Now I'll go to the modifiers tab of the properties editor, go to add modifier, generate, and multi-resolution. This modifier is like the subdivision surface modifier, but it's specifically for sculpting. So I can go ahead and click subdivide. Notice that I can't really go up in arrows. Over here, I have to actually go down to subdivision and click subdivide. I'll do that twice. And then I'll go back to sculpt mode. Now, if I use my grab tool, I can grab any of these vertices, even though this isn't the mesh in edit mode. In edit mode, I still see my cube, but in sculpt mode, I'm able to work with all of these different vertices. This is essentially like working with different layers of detail. I can subdivide this as much as I'd like and draw out some detail, just like so. And then I can jump down levels of subdivision. I'll go all the way back to level zero here, use my grab tool, and really transform this. Now when I jump back up, it'll try to propagate that detail as much as possible. Now, I wouldn't recommend making huge changes on lower levels of subdivision, as that sometimes can cause problems. But overall, this is a really robust way to work at different levels of detail. You'll notice that as I'm orbiting around, I'm getting one of the lowest levels. And then when I let go of my navigation, then it pops back. If you don't like that, then you can go up to options in the top right of the tool header, 
and disable fast navigate. We won't really need it for this tutorial, but if you're getting up to millions of polygons, then it might be helpful. Now let's do a little project to put together what we've learned. For that, we'll make an apple. I'll hit tab to go to object mode and delete my cube here, and then hit shift A, and this time I'll add a UV sphere. Then I'll go to add modifier, and I'll add another multi-resolution modifier. We don't generally want to subdivide spheres too much because we'll get a lot of pinching up here at the top and the bottom near the poles, but since that area will be hidden inside the core anyway, I'm not too worried about it. So I'll hit control tab and go to sculpt mode, and the first thing that I'm going to do is squish this into a shape of an apple. I'll hit one on my number pad to go to front view, and then I'll choose my elastic to form, hit F and scale my brush up really big, and just push this in a bit along the bottom sides. I'll also take the top and pull it down. Once I have the right shape, then I'll go to side view with three, and again, push this in a little bit, and now since I've only done this from front and side view, it's probably going to be a little bit square. So if I look at it from the other angles, I can then push this in just like so. All right, now I don't really need to see this wireframe anymore, so I'll go to my overlays and turn that off. And next, let's pull down the very center of it to add that core. I'll hit F and get a little bit smaller of a brush. Zoom in a bit and then go from the side and wait until that yellow dot is over that top vertex and just pull that straight down. It might not have gone straight down in the center, so I can move that back into place just like so. And I'll do the same for the bottom. I'll look at this at a pretty sharp angle, grab that bottom vertex and just pull it up. Then look at it from the bottom and move that back to the center. I'm noticing that it's still a little boxy from this side, so I'll also just get a bigger brush and push and pull until it's more rounded. All right, now I'd like to add a little bit more detail to this apple some ridges on the top and the bottom. So to do that, I'll go ahead and subdivide in my multi-resolution modifier. Then I'll take my draw sharp tool and draw some ridges. Now it's pretty tempting to want to increase the subdivisions as much as possible because it's more fun to sculpt that way. If I subdivide this a few times and then use my draw sharp tool, this feels more like I'm working with clay. And while you can work that way if you want to, what you'll often find is that your results are gonna be pretty lumpy. The number one way to avoid lumps is to work on lower resolutions of detail until you absolutely need to move up. So here I'll just subdivide it until I'm on level two and draw my details there, only moving up when I absolutely need to. Now on the top, I won't make too many creases and I'll also smooth them out quite a bit by holding down shift and smoothing that out. Now I'll go and do this on the bottom where I'll make it a little bit more extreme. I'll use a smaller brush. And dig in a little bit more. Then I'll also take my clay tool and make it more rounded here towards the bottom. I'll increase my strength a bit. Use more pressure sensitivity. And really push out these lumps. Then when I'm done, I'll go ahead and hold down shift and smooth this out closer to the top. And to make this affect the rest of the apple just a little bit, I'll use a bigger brush, turn down my strength, and just draw up and along the apple. I'll keep it pretty subtle though. All right, I'll do the same thing here towards the top. I'll just make this a little bit more interesting so it's not quite so smooth. And the good thing about apples is they come in all different types of shapes and sizes. So however yours turns out, there's probably an apple somewhere out there that looks just like it. The next thing that I'll do is just hold down shift and smooth this out a little bit towards the center. Though that's probably a bit too much smoothing, so I'll go to my smooth tool, hit shift F, and decrease the strength. I'll speed up the clip just a little bit here because all I'm doing is smoothing, but I do it for a while. All right, now that I've done that, I'll take one last look at it with the elastic deform brush 
and make any last tweaks to the overall shape that I want. I'll look at it from all different angles, push and pull, until I'm happy with it. Then once you're done, hit Control Tab and let's go back to Object Mode. Here it'll pop back to level 0 of the multi-resolution modifier, but I can bump this up in Object Mode as well. Then I'll also right click and shade smooth. And I probably should have mentioned this earlier, but as you're sculpting, it's often helpful to use different types of viewport materials in order to better see the surface of your sculpt. So to do that, I'll go up to the top right under the solid shaded view options and switch from studio to matte cap. Under matte cap, we have all of these different materials that we can use, and these are often a little bit better for sculpting. I think I have a couple custom ones in here, but I know this red one is default and it's often used for sculpting because, well, ZBrush. In our case though, it happens to make this look more like an apple, so I'll go with it. Now to finish off this mini project, I'll add a stem just by hitting Shift A in object mode and adding a new circle. I definitely don't need this many vertices though, so I'll go to the redo panel and set this to something like eight. Then I'll hit tab to go into edit mode, scale down this circle, and now I can't see it, so I'll hit Z and go to wireframe view, one to front view, and scale this down a bit and put it right underneath the bottom of our core. Now somehow I accidentally turned snapping on at some point along this journey, so I'll turn that off scale this down a little bit more, and then just hit E to extrude and extrude this upwards. Though that's still a little bit too thick, so I'll scale that down even more. Grab that top, E to extrude, rotate it a bit, E to extrude, rotate it a bit, and E to extrude one more time. Then I'll go back to solid view, and you'll notice that the shading here is a little bit weird, and that's because our normals are backwards. We can also double check that in the overlays by turning on face orientation, and you can see that they are indeed backwards. So just head to edit mode again, select everything, and then let's go to mesh, down to normals, and choose recalculate outside, or use the hotkey shift N. Now I'll turn off my face orientation, and in my modifiers, I'll add a subdivision surface. I'll bump that up to two so it matches the apple nicely, and let's finish this off by capping the tip. I'll select all of those vertices, and just hit F to make a face. To sharpen this up, I'll hit Control B to bevel. Then I'll hit Tab to go to Object Mode, right click, and Shade Smooth. Now it's maybe a little bit too small, so I'll scale it up just a bit. And also, that makes me think that I don't really know how big this apple is at all. It's often good practice to model to real world scale, but if I were to select my apple and then go to the sidebar and check out the Item tab, I'll see under the dimensions that this apple is 1.5 meters high. This seems a bit ridiculous, so I'll set it to something smaller. Now, I don't know metric units off the top of my head as well, so I'll just type in 4 and then IN for inches. That will do all the conversion for me, and it'll flatten it out so that it's the right height, and now I need the X and Y values to follow in the right proportion. So to do that, I'll just take my Z value and just copy that with Control c and then hover over the Y value and hit Control v to paste, and do the same thing for the X. Now, I'll also do that for this stem but since we scaled it up a little bit before, I need to apply scale before doing this, just to make sure that that's 111. So we'll go to Object, Apply, and Apply Scale, or use the hotkey Control A, and then again, hover over these values and just hit Control V. I also could have parented it to the apple before scaling, which would have been easier. With that, you've now sculpted your first organic object, or it can just be regular if you don't mind the pesticides, but either way, you've made a shape that would be much more difficult to model manually. Obviously, there's so much more to sculpt mode than what we covered in this video, so if you want a really thorough, in-depth introduction to it, I would recommend checking out Kent Trammell's Fundamentals of Sculpting course on CG Cookie. Here, he'll walk you through not only the tools and the settings and how it works in Blender, but also the ideas and the processes that will help you start sculpting in general, even if you're completely brand new to it. For this lesson, though, if you want to get a little bit more practice, try making some other fruit or vegetable. Then, join me in the next lesson, where we'll wrap up the course.